Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Family Matters interview series. We are joined today by Dr. Melissa Tanner, who has agreed to be our healthcare expert and share some information with you about memory, memory issues, forgetfulness, and how to take some proactive steps to um, support your brain health and overall cognitive skills as you age. Dr. Tanner, welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. We're glad to have you. Before we even jump into our topic, would you mind telling our families just a little bit about yourself and your role at CounterPoint Health Services? Sure. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in assessment, re research, and care for older adults. I've been with CounterPoint since 2013, um, which was actually when I first obtained my psychology license. So I've been with the company for my entire career. And I actually feel very lucky to have found a company that has supported my professional growth the way CounterPoint has. My current role is Vice President of Compliance and Education. Uh, so I spend about half my time doing clinical work, a quarter doing uh, developing and delivering education to our facility partners, and then the remaining quarter, um, with compliance initiatives, which means I have to stay abreast of developments from uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, ensuring the company adheres to regulations for care of older adults. Um, but also I maintain a connection to BCAT. Um, so I'm often collecting data or collaborating on different projects. Um, the connection to the BCAT is really important to me. Um, one of the things I, I really do value about working for CounterPoint because it gives me confidence that the care we're providing is highest quality and evidence-based, uh, two very important things. Um, but so you can see I wear a lot of different hats in my role. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, in a single day, I could be giving an in-service uh, to nursing home staff, collecting data, providing care um, to older adults, and also consulting with families. And uh, I recognize the latter, uh, consulting with families is so important to care for older adults. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so honored uh, to be part of the Family Matters series. We're so glad you're here today. Mm -hmm. I know in your work with families, you've probably had some questions come your way from family members about their loved ones who are maybe concerned with a change in their spouse or their parent as it relates to memory loss. You know, we know memory is an important skill. When you have any kind of um, changes in memory, you might see it show up in the ability to do daily tasks, things like managing your medications, driving, you know, overall living independently. Can you take us through the normal aging process and what, what are some subtle changes we may expect to see as we age or as our loved ones age? Sure. Um, well, first I'll just state the obvious, you know, we all know aging is inevitable. Uh, it affects all bodily process as processes as we're all painfully aware. Um, but the brain is no exception. Uh, I like to make an analogy about running. I'm an avid runner. Um, and for now, I'm still trying to run my fastest times, but I also recognize in the near future, that's gonna change. So we all kind of understand that um, whether we like it or not, our body slows down a little bit. Our running speed, our athletic speed um, declines as we as we age. Um, so I tell my parent, my patients rather that we can expect those kinds of things to decline. Um, but we should also expect our memory and cognitive skills to decline or slow a little bit. And that's normal. Um, so altering our expectations and understanding that we may be a, a little bit more forgetful as we age, that can sometimes help us cope when, when it happens. And also it can be comforting to know that what we're going through is normal and expected. Um, most people don't realize, but our brain volume actually shrinks, um, quite a bit as we age. So Interesting. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, something like seven cubic centimeters per year, starting at 65. Um, so you can see, uh, it's understandable that there are going to be some functional changes that go along with those physical changes, 
Um, and those are not necessarily pathological. Th those are normal and expected. Um, what I would say is that it often requires a formal assessment to differentiate what's normal age-related cognitive changes from true cognitive impairment. But I'll give you some examples of, of things that might be considered more normal. Okay, that'd be helpful. Sure. So imagine you're you're playing a game of trivia with your family and say, you know, you've got three generations. You've got your son and your granddaughter and you, you're playing a trivia game. And for someone who has a background in American history um, and you have a question about American history, it wouldn't necessarily be cause for concern if your granddaughter answers before you. Um, your processing speed is going to slow down a little bit as you age, and that's normal. On the other hand, it would be cause for concern if you couldn't remember something like who the first president of the United States was. This is something that, particularly for someone with a background in history, that's going to be a, a firmly encoded bit of uh, what's called semantic memory or long-term memory for facts. So, so you can see um, normal to, to be a little bit slower in recalling, not normal to forget, you know, very basic uh, long-term memories. Um, it's also normal to misplace things. So maybe you're, you're losing track of your keys or your cell phone more frequently. It is not normal for you to be finding things in odd places or in places where they don't belong. Like say you find your, your keys in the refrigerator or you find food in, in your hall closet where you keep your coats. Um, those things would be cause for a concern. Um, I'll give you one more example, time orientation. So being oriented to the day of the week, the month, the year, um, it's normal to occasionally mix up the day of the week, especially if your uh, retirement schedule is doesn't vary much between weekends and weekdays. What wouldn't be normal would be to not be able to identify the month or the year or the season. Um, so that's those are just a few examples. But all that said, I, I always recommend talking to a professional if you do have concerns about your memory. I love those examples. I think people can relate to having maybe had some of those kind of slips happen where you just can't put your finger on the name of something or, you know, all of a sudden, oh, I got it now. But definitely some good ideas as far as things to be on the lookout for if you start to notice consistent or pattern changes over time. Um, you did a really great job of explaining sort of, sort of normal aging and what we might anticipate or expect as we age. Can you compare that to, let's say, um, a diagnosis of dementia? I think a lot of families are often nervous when they see changes in a loved one, they immediately begin to think, you know, this may be um, a dementia at, at play and they're looking for symptoms. They're looking for signs. You know, how does normal aging and dementia, how do they compare and kind of how are they different? Sure. Um, I would say in most cases, the difference is in the severity or the extent to which the impairment affects someone's day-to-day -day functioning. Um, but also, I want to um, take a moment to kind of mention that there are different kinds of dementia. Um, dementia is an umbrella term, and underneath it are different diseases, and um, they all affect memory and other cognitive abilities, but they have different signs or, or first signs to, to let you know that, that there is a problem. So for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, which is one, one type of dementia, you would see memory problems, getting lost, um, struggling to com complete uh, normal activities of daily living. Those are typically the first signs. Um, with frontotemporal dementia, however, you're gonna see more personality changes. Um, things like apathy and disinhibition are typically the first signs for that type of dementia. Um, with vascular dementia, the signs would depend on the area of the brain that was affected by the stroke. Um, so you could see a lot of different signs, and it really just depends on the source of the cognitive impairment. That's that's helpful. I think educating and understanding that uh, dementia is sort of a catch-all term 
And you may need further assessment, further diagnosis to kind of narrow down if something is present, what it is and what does that mean for your loved one? So I think that's a, a great suggestion for us to be considerate of. Mm-hmm. So if our if our family member has seen the signs, maybe has taken their loved one to meet with their primary care physician, you know, they want to kind of start to talk this through with somebody. And that primary care physician mentions mild cognitive impairment and the words dementia. You know, sometimes people think those words are interchangeable. What's really the difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia in case in case those terms are shared with a family member just so they sort of have an understanding? Uh, that's a very good question. I think the term um, MCI is thrown around a lot, but um, sometimes there isn't a lot of clarity about what we mean when we, we use that term. Um, first, I'll say cognition exists on a continuum. So if you can think of it as a continuum, along that continuum, you have normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, mild dementia, moderate dementia, severe dementia. Um, So, and again, as I said, dementia is not a specific disease or illness, but a term used to refer to several different um, diseases affecting memory and other cognitive skills. But mild cognitive impairment or MCI is is used to refer to a cognitive syndrome that could represent a pre-dementia phase. Um, Although uh, it shouldn't be confused with dementia, um, folks with MCI are at a heightened risk for developing dementia and particularly Alzheimer's disease. Studies show that um, people with MCI are at least five times more likely to develop dementia than people without MCI. but I also want to emphasize that even though it has the word mild within it, it, it really uh, should be taken seriously because a person with MCI is likely to have more difficulty completing things like instrumental activities of daily living, which include things like managing transportation, managing medications, handling their finances. So um, it really is something that should be taken seriously. Um, and you know it could it could affect specific skills. Um, it could be global. It could affect memory. It could affect executive functions. So there are a lot of different presentations within um, the realm of MCI. But I guess the the point that I want to convey is that although it has this term mild within it, it is something to be taken seriously. Yeah, that's a little misleading, right? When something mm-hmm. has the word mild at the beginning, you think to yourself, oh, it's it's subtle, it's small, it's maybe not a concern, but mm-hmm. you know, anytime there's a change in someone's ability to perform activities that they need to do to maintain their independent lifestyle, it's probably a concern for families. Exactly. Because so we're thinking about concerns and some of the signs and symptoms of these changes in cognition, how do families know what might be sort of a a one-time event and how do they know when I really need to have a a one-on-one with our, you know, our family practitioner, how can they differentiate between those kind of situationally? Um, I mean, I would say that you want to err on the side of caution. So when cognitive changes negatively impact a loved one's functioning in any way, I would say it's time to reach out to a healthcare professional. So um, if if the cognitive changes um, impact the person's ability to maintain their usual routine or perform, um, as I was saying, the activities of daily living, it's time to seek help. Um, But that's not to say that you have to wait until that point. Um, Actually, the BCAT has a cognitive self-assessment called My Mem Check, um, and it is strongly predictive of cognitive functioning, and it can be completed at home. So, if you're not certain if the concerns warrant a visit to a healthcare professional, but you you do want to kind of address them in some way, you could take the my mem check, and then if there are concerns um, that are identified in my mem check, you could take the report and and bring it to your uh, primary care or another healthcare professional, and they would be able to guide you through next steps. That's a great idea. So in the comfort of your own home, you can do a a screening tool, answer some questions and get a snapshot of 
what, you know, are you having real issues? Do you need further, further assessment or further discussion with a primary care doctor? Mm -hmm. Dr. Tanner, if someone does seek out their primary care physician and they do feel strongly that they're having concerns, what will that look like? What, what kind of recommendations happen after that? What is the process for folks who might actually be having some changes? What should they expect um, as next steps? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, first, I, I do want to just kind of touch on um, kind of the, the pathways for um, addressing concerns, um, because I, I do think that the BCAT actually offers some of the most direct pathways for getting help um, and also different pathways to suit different needs. So as I was saying, for someone who has very subtle cognitive changes that aren't necessarily impacting their day-to-day -day life, um, my mem check is an ideal resource because it, it may be able to reassure them that there isn't cause for concern, or it may um, suggest that uh, further testing, maybe more in-depth testing is warranted. Um, but for people or families who do have more significant cognitive concerns, maybe there, there is um, some degree of concern about their, their functioning being impacted by cognitive changes. Um, there are actually more comprehensive evaluations that can be done virtually um, through the BCAT. So this is a assessment that can be done in about 20 minutes and it assesses global cognition, also specific skills that are relevant to IADLs um, or instrumental activities of daily living. And from this assessment, a comprehensive report is generated that can be shared with the healthcare team. So you asked about next steps when they see the, the primary care, and um, it would depend on kind of what, what the testing says, but it often involves a neurology consult just to kind of look at the brain and see what um, neurodegenerative processes might, might be involved. Um, there could be pharmacological interventions that could help. Um, often there are recommendations for changes in level of care just to meet the person's needs if, if there are um, kind of concerns about safety um, or level of supervision. So it really depends on what comes from, from that uh, cognitive evaluation, but I do believe that that's kind of a very good starting point um, to begin these conversations about what be might be needed in terms of um, caregiving in terms of um, further neurological consults, pharmacological interventions, it, that testing is a really good place to start. Yeah, I, I like how you mentioned, you know, you don't have to wait until you're sort of in, in panic mode or you're feeling like things have gotten more severe. At the first sign of changes, it might be the best time to be more proactive and try to get some information you know, if there are some subtle changes, you have a healthcare provider sort of connected to you, helping you with your action plan mm -hmm. on how to manage or navigate that. And I think, you know, having a proactive approach to your health is always, you know, the best bet, especially around cognition, right? Those folks that have good cognition want to keep their, their really good cognition. And I think folks that are having maybe subtle or small changes you know, we're looking for ways to slow that decline or minimize any further decline that they might experience. Do you have any suggestions around how to proactively address your brain health and kind of keep keep your good cognition? I do. So the good news is there absolutely are proactive steps you can take uh, to either preserve your current level of functioning or buffer against decline. Um, I like to think of dementia as the final destination of a train, okay? So once the train is in motion, you can't stop it or turn it around, but you can slow, slow it down or um, through brain healthy habits, you can actually prevent the tracks from being laid. Um, so that means, you know, there are ways that you can reduce your risk of developing dementia, or if, if you already have signs of cognitive impairment, you can help preserve the current your current level of functioning, your current skills. And those kinds of strat brain healthy strategies include things like physical exercise, um, engaging in some type of uh, physical exercise, 
you know, three to five times a week, abstaining from smoking, uh, controlling hypertension, treating mood disorders, um, maintaining a healthy body weight, and also cognitive exercises. So um, you can learn more about those steps on the Enrich website, um, which I think link, Lynn will link at the end of this talk. We can definitely pull that up for you folks at the end. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is there is definitely reason to hope. You know, there is at this point there are there is no disease altering treatment for dementia, but we do have a lot of preventative strategies that um, give us cause for hope. That's that's great news, and I'm sure our families out there will really be interested in kind of getting getting some of those tools and resources on board so that they are sure they're, you know, being able to do everything they can to help with overall health. For the caregivers out there, for the family members who are maybe living with someone who's experiencing memory impairment or who's responsible for taking care of a loved one who's living alone, but who's also experiencing memory impairment, do you have any strategies that you could share that might be helpful or that, that can help support, um, you know, those loved ones as they might be struggling with some of these changes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do often get caregivers I work with telling me that their loved ones struggle with being told to, to practice the brain healthy habits. I think a lot of them already feel a loss of autonomy. So being told to do something else can sometimes feel infantilizing, um, which is understandable. From my experience, um, caregivers tend to have the best luck in encouraging those kinds of practices when they find a way to gamify it or make it more fun. So for example, um, your loved one might have a preference for a certain kind of physical activity, physical exercise, or um, they might prefer certain cognitive exercises over others. I would certainly allow them to choose the ones that they like, um, just so that it's an enjoyable um, habit that they're more likely to sustain. Um, also explaining to them in clear, concrete terms what the purpose of, of the exercises or, or the habits are um, can help harness motivation and help them become self-motivated so that you're not always kind of hounding them to, to engage in those habits. Um, you know, I think um, the BCAT has some wonderful uh, options for cognitive exercises in particular that can be both challenging and fun, um, and they can be easily adapted into a brain health routine. Um, so I think there, there are options out there that can help uh, that can help make it easier on caregivers. Yeah, these are great suggestions. I, I think, you know, I know we're almost out of time, but I what I'm what I'm hearing is some really good takeaways for families is focusing on your brain health is also part of focusing on your overall health. You mentioned physical activity and and managing your weight and and not smoking, you know, yes. all the things that impact overall health, you also get that secondary benefit of improving, you know, your brain health, your thinking skills. So mm -hmm. that's great news. You know, don't wait to take action. If you suspect that there's something going on, always better to err on the side of caution, reach out. I love the idea of the assessment tools that are out there. You can do something in your own home to start off. You can do a virtual visit with someone or you can go into the office, mm -hmm. but kind of getting your head around what is going on and having that assessment is a really great first step for folks. So they know what to do next, who, who to follow up with, you know, what they need to do as far as that action plan for their health. Mm -hmm. And, and then finally, you know, ma making sure that we're learning as we go, if there are any diagnoses or terminology that's coming at you, that you're able to sort of understand some of these terms, some are more general, some are more specific. You don't be afraid to ask those questions and kind of get that information that you really need to inform next steps and to help families and their loved ones make decisions around, are they safe here? Do they need to be moved to a different level of care? How can we support you where you are today, but also kind of plan for down the road? So I think these are really great actionable steps that people can kind of implement immediately. We're so thankful for you taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and all of this information with our families. 
And we'd love to have you back another time to share something else. Certainly, I'd love to come back. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going to conclude our Family Matters session for today and thank everyone for joining and hope to see you back here soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.